Deborah, and I am here with my co-host Willie. He wanted to come in, of course, and help me out to do this podcast. Uh, this is a podcast about my crafting. I like to do all the crafts. I like to knit, crochet, sew, quilt, make baskets, make jewelry, pretty much anything I can get my hands on. I am also a professor of physics and astronomy at a local university, so I like to talk about science topics and look for places where they overlap, as you'll see this week, with crafting. And also, I am a third-generation family farmer. I live here on my family farm of 170 acres in the foothills of the Arkansas Ozarks, where I raise grass-fed beef cattle, and I also have Appaloosa and paint horses, plus I have heritage poultry, show quality rabbits, and I am a haven to some rescued donkeys, miniature horses, and a miniature mule named Pumpkin who thinks she rules a roost. And as you can tell from my charming co-host, I am also fur kid mom to 14 dogs, five indoor cats, and an undetermined number of outside cats who I am trying to get friendly enough so that I can catch them and take them to have them spayed and neutered. Uh, but anyway, so welcome to the Funny Farm and welcome to this podcast. If you're a new viewer, welcome. I'm glad you're joining us for the first time and hope you find something that you find entertaining. And if you're a returning viewer, I sure am tickled that you've come back again this week to see what was going on here. So we're going to get started right away with a Diary of a Physicist Farm Gal episode number 15. <laughs> Okay, if you're looking for us on social media, uh, my farm Facebook page is the same as my YouTube channel name. It is Buckthorn Farms. And also, you can find me on Instagram and on Ravelry as Doc Firewoman. You can also email me at Deborah at BuckthornFarms.com. I'll put that all that information down below in uh, the information on bar on the YouTube channel or the YouTube video. And also, there is a Ravelry group for the podcast. Um, so, I want to tell you a little bit about some things that are going on there. We do have a charity make-along that's about to wind down. It ends on July the 2nd, which will be two weeks. No, a week. It's a week from today. <laughs> ah, it's a week from today. Um, and so, we'll be ending our uh, charity make-along where we are aiming to make items for any kind of charity you can knit. You can crochet, you can sew, you can quilt. I don't care. We just want to do some good uh, in the world. And there are some prizes uh, for that. I will probably draw for those, not the next episode, but the one after that. Um, let everybody get everything turned in or submitted on the second, and then I'll draw after that. Um, yeah, so if you want to find us, come on over there and please do share the podcast and like and comment on it. It helps raise our profile a little bit. Um, I'd like to get some more viewers if we could. Um, if not, that's fine too. I appreciate quality over quantity, right? <laughs> but anyway, so now we're going to move on down the road here and talk about some finished objects. Okay, I've got three finished objects this week and one quasi-finished object, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Mostly this week what I've got finished are sewing items, um, and then I have some yarny uh, works in progress that I'll show you in a minute. So, first of all, um, I was going to show you, I tried my first attempt at needle felting. Okay, I had showed this kit a couple of weeks ago or a few episodes ago. I had bought this kit at Gate City Yarns. Uh, in Greensboro, North Carolina, when I went out there for a, a conference. I have never tried needle felting, and that's pretty obvious from looking at him, but at least hopefully you can tell what he is. He's a little sea otter, okay? And the kit makes two, so I'm going to make another one, try to learn a little bit. I did learn that felting needles are extremely sharp, <laughs> and I was being very careful, but I still poked myself a couple of times. But I think he's really cute. I thought he turned out really cute for my first effort. So I did make one little sea otter. Then the next thing that I got finished is my little Monty the Reindeer. Now he's just a little decoration. This is a kit that I probably have owned for over 20 years. It's a Wimpole Street Creations kit. I purchased it when Joanne Fabrics was still called Cloth World 
at their Oklahoma City location when I used to live in Norman. And he has sat in my box of kits and things for all this time. And I pulled him out the other day and finished him up. He is a chenille uh, kit. Okay, a little chenille reindeer. Okay, so I put him together. So got that. That is a long-awaited <laughs> thing to be finished. Okay, and then last but not least, I showed him last week, and I have finished the turkey. I finished the turkey. Yay! I decided not to put um, trims on his tail because I thought it would make him too busy. But since his chest was kind of plain, I added some buttons. I've got his waddle put on, and I did put uh, the pellets in the doll pellets in him to make him stable okay and I am calling it a him because it's a him because he's got a waddle okay hang on just a second Willie what are you into come here come here okay so anyway I did get my turkey finished so that's going to be another item that goes in my fair entry box so those are my three um finished objects and then I'll show my quasi finished object in works in progress so let's go on to that Okay, so for my works in progress, um, my quasi-finished object is I made my other qu lap quilt top for the hospice house. Now, this one is not quite as big as the one before, okay? I didn't make it quite as wide, but I still think it makes a nice size lap quilt, all right? And um, I put the blocks together a little bit differently. I wanted to use up most all of the blocks so I wouldn't have... A lot of things left over so I got it finished so now I just have to get these put together and tied this week. so I'm gonna try to do that oops I knocked my cup down I'm gonna try to do that uh, this week so I'll get that taken care of hang on let me retrieve my cup here okay all right then um, the other thing that I have worked on this week is my Kraken shawl. Okay, I did get quite a bit done on it. Um, this is the pattern by Two Hearts Crochet. Oh goodness, come here. All right. This is a pattern by Two Hearts Crochet. It is living in my April 9 Designs bag here. And she's on Etsy. She has an Etsy shop where you can find her bags. I think they're really great quality. Um, I did get quite a ways uh, done on this. Get it pulled out here. So I have done 24 rows out of 60, but the rows are getting shorter. Okay, you start with your longest row and then you work your way down. Okay, and it is filet crochet. I think I said pico crochet last week. I don't know what that is. I don't think that's a thing. But it's kind of hard to see. I need to hold it up against a light background where you can kind of see. But the Kraken body is here in the center. Okay, and you can see his eyes. So I have made quite a bit of progress on this. And I think after I block it too, that's going to help it quite a bit. So I'm 24 rows in. And I've got, uh, I think there's 63 rows total. Um, I'll just quickly flash the chart up here so you can see what it looks like. Okay. So, um, yeah, so the yarn that I'm using is um, Kama Sutra Fiber Arts. This is one of my balls that I haven't started yet. The Kama Sutra Fiber Arts, uh, she is on Etsy also. Uh, and this is her MCN base, and it is a colorway called Northern Lights. And it's a beautiful colorway. It is very, 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 working up really pretty. I don't know how well you can see that, but... It is very beautiful. The green in there is almost fluorescent green in places, which makes it really pop. Okay, so um, yeah, so I definitely this will look beautiful worn over like a white t-shirt or something like that. I'm going to try to get it finished uh, in the next week or so. So uh, those are my two main works in progress. I have some other little bits and pieces and, and of course some things that I've already shown a couple of times that I haven't I've maybe done a row or so on those other two shawls, so it's not really worth showing. So I'm going to forgo that this week. So let's move on and talk about some future crafting.
Okay, so as we move into future crafting, I wanted to mention a couple of other podcasters' make-alongs that they're having that I'm actually working on some objects for. The first one is the Happy Knitting Podcast with Julia. She's out of uh, Germany, and she is doing what she's calling the Summer Stash Down, and it runs through August, and the goal is to, is to knit or crochet something from Stash. So my Kraken shawl was from Stash. I bought that yarn way back in the early part of the year. Uh, so that will qualify. And if I can get my um, Raina shawl finished, that will also qualify. I bought the yarn specifically for the Helen Stewart one. So technically that's not Stash. Uh, the other ones uh, are Vanessa at A Historian Knits is having a Finish It make-along. Um, I forgot to check the dates on that, but I'm no, I believe it runs for sure, I think through the end of July, but I need to double check the dates on that. Uh, the idea is anything that you've started before April 1st, and it is wide open. She takes cross stitch, she takes sewing, uh, anything that you started before April 1st that you want to finish. So my Raina shawl, uh, will qualify for that. And a couple of the future crafting things that I'm going to show you will also qualify if I can get them finished. And last but not least is the Yarn Hoarder, Amber the Yarn Hoarder. Um, her make-along, one of them that she has going on, is the Unsung Heroes make-along, where if you choose a pattern on Ravelry that has less than 30 projects, you can enter uh, for that. And I believe my Kraken shawl will qualify. I need to double check. I actually haven't even started, now that I think about it, a Ravelry page for that. So I probably should, a project page, I probably should do that. Um, so those are just some other opportunities. And I'll link all those podcasts below because I like to lift other podcasters up. So, okay. So, um, yeah. So let's get started with some future crafting. Now, this is one that will definitely qualify for the finish it because this was started before I moved back from Oklahoma so it is at least uh, 13 years old and I have worked on it since I've lived in Arkansas but it I took a class at the quilting shop a patchwork place and it was one of the last classes that I took there and there was a um, class on I can't remember the name of the pattern, but it's sort of an interesting wedge pinwheel. And the goal was, I believe it was to make a 4th of July. I think it was a 4th of July quilt, but I can't remember. So here's mine. Okay, now I wanted to make this for a couple of reasons. The main thing that, that spurred me on to make it, no pun intended, was my first horse that I owned as an adult was a, race, uh, was a retired race horse. He was an off-the-track thoroughbred. Uh, loved that horse to death. His name was Patriot, uh, or Patriot Persuader was his was his registered name, but I called him Patriot. And so all of his um, accessories were red, white, and blue. And so I saw this as a neat opportunity to kind of do an honor to him. So I have finished the top. It is a wall hanging, okay? And so now I just have to get it put together and quilted. So that is one of my goals to complete that. And I want to do a good job on it because I actually want to enter this in the quilting division at the fair, not the crafting division. The quilting division is a lot more challenging. Um, and so my big goal is to enter and to do good, uh, do better than I've been doing. I've been getting seconds and I would like to get at least one first this year. Um, so my big thing that I need to work on is improving the quality of my binding and I've had several people give me advice on how to do that. Um, so yeah, and this is what I'm going to use for the backing for that quilt. Okay. Now the next one I need, <laughs> I need a little, um, a little, um, preface and I don't know if I'm going to enter this in the fair or not or just finish it for myself. Um, my family we didn't we didn't do a lot together we weren't sort of the norman we were never norman rockwell but one of the things that we did like to do is when my grandfather was still alive especially is we played pitch which is a card game and my dad and my mom would be a team and my grandfather and i would be a team and i think sometimes my dad underestimated just how wily my grandfather was because you know, my dad would think, oh, we got them licked. And then my grandfather would give him a pretty good thumping on the scores. And it was really funny. And my grandfather, when he would laugh, his whole face would kind of crinkle up. And he would just get so tickled. And um, 
I miss him a lot. <laughs> um, but we used to play pitch, and one, we would go sometimes um, to a cousin of mine's house, and we would have two tables going. My cousin and I would be a team, or my cousin's wife and I would be a team, and then my cousin and my dad would be a team, and then my mom and my cousin's mother, I guess, who's also my cousin, and then I forget, I, I, we somehow we got two tables worth of people playing. My grandfather, when he was still alive, he would go too. And one time we were playing and, you know, once the hand is over, everybody's like, well, if you had done this and if you had done this. And my dad just out of nowhere says, if an elephant had wings, it would be a mighty big bird too. <laughs> well, not long after that, um, I went up the road to Miss Esther Mays. Miss Esther Mays is no longer with us, but she was quite the um, sewer and the quilter. And she had a ton of quilt patterns, and she let me copy them and make copies of them or draw them. Mostly what I did was trace templates out on, like, grocery bags. She gave me a whole bunch of brown grocery bags. Well, one of the templates she had was for an elephant. <laughs> so I got the bright idea that I was going to make a block out of some scrap fabrics that I had and I was gonna make some flying elephants so what I did was I made a whole bunch of flying elephants kind of going every which way and then of course not know what this was I mean again this was something I made when I lived in Oklahoma so this is at least you know probably it, I, this I suspect is probably more like 20 years old Okay, so what I did was I just zigzag stitched around them and then I drew their eyes and their um, their tails with permanent marker. Not the greatest thing for me to do. So what I would like to do is go back and satin stitch their tails and their eyes and then satin stitch around them and eventually quilt this. So if an elephant had wings, it would be a mighty big bird. <laughs> So, yeah, um, so there is that languishing UFO, you know, that I need to bring back to life. So I'd like to get that done. I'll probably tie that as a quilt, but I might quilt that those big blue squares give me some opportunities to do some things. Now, um, a couple more sewing related um, future craftings. Um, I found this really cute cute, excuse me, little apron panel, okay? Um, I love fall, so this is a little fall apron panel, okay? It's a little fall apron panel. It's got a cute little uh, recipe on it there for pumpkin cheesecake, okay? And then bread pudding. So, uh, I found this little panel. Now, normally the panels just have you cut out the fabric as is and just do a, a um, just a hem around it or seam I should say hem hem around it but I like to put backing on mine so I'm going to use this fabric as the backing and I'm going to back both my ties and my apron so make the ties a little bit wider so I don't have to fold them in half uh, and just take it uh, elevated a little bit the other fall thing that I have is um, a couple of wall hangings one of them is a banner, okay, here, and it says, uh, Autumn is the time to rejoice in Mother Earth's bounty and to be thankful. And that's kind of what where my thinking has been this week. And then this is just a little sort of wall quilt. It's kind of folded over, but it's a little wall quilt. So I'm gonna try to get those two made because I love, um, I, I have a lot of Halloween decorations, but I don't have a lot of just straight up sort of fall harvesty decorations. So I'm gonna try to get that put together also. Now, um, my other future crafting, my yarny one, kind of treads over into acquisitions a little bit, uh, but I was watching, um, who was I watching that's doing Vertices Unite? watching a podcast yesterday and they were going to start a Vertices Unite and I can't remember who it was. I know that Amy from the Stranded Podcast has made one. Um, oh, Julia. Julia was talking about, um, or no, 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 no. Um, the lady from Fat Squirrel Speaks, she was talking about um, 
going to make a Vertices Unite. Um, that she had had a week and she had some very good words and very honest, heartfelt words at the beginning of her podcast this week. So if the state of the world has been sort of weighing on you, I highly recommend go, going and watching the latest um, episode of Fat Squirrel Speaks because she says some good words and it's at the beginning. You can kind of get, get through to the beginning fairly easily. Um, but um, she was talking about it. And I have been wanting to make one for a while. I just kind of put it on the back burner. But um, I mentioned a few podcasts ago that one day the yarn store that I go to, Knit Two Together, who is owned by Stephanie, um, she got in a whole shebang, brand new shipment of Primrose Yarn Company yarn. And I just happened to be there when the big fun bag of fun arrived. And so I got to dive into it one of the first people that got to dive into it. And I had seen Amy talk about, and I think also Skane Deer, Ellie from Skane Deer Knits made one. I had seen them talk about it. And I, um, I'm a big girl, okay? I'm 5'10", I weigh around, well, I weigh enough. that It, it takes a lot of wind to try to blow me away. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, I weigh enough. All right, uh, I am not, a little shrinking you know little little thin thing I never have been I never will be because I'm just a big girl and also I like to eat <laughs> and I don't make any apologies for that um, I like to eat I like food um, but I'm also just you know big I'm, I'm, I'm big I'm a big strapping corn-fed farm girl and that's that's just fine but um, I thought, okay, this is a nice big shawl, and it's a really neat opportunity to play with color. And so, I got to digging around in the Primrose bag, and I picked out these colors for Vertices Unite. Okay? These are all Primrose. Now, they're all um, Sophia, except for this one. This is an Adelaide. Okay, um, it's a nice dark, rich blue, and then these are all Sophia. So this one is Old Tailored Suit, and then this one is Real Hipsters Wear Denim, and that's interesting because I want to talk about recycling denim when we get a little bit further down, okay? This one is a one-off. Um... This one is Neon Gypsy. And then this one is Dream House. Okay. And I wanted something. What? The first thing that I saw. No, 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 no. You don't. No, 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 no. no. You don't need that straight pin. No, sir. Willie. You don't need any iron in your diet. Okay. The, the color that I saw that got my attention was this one. I was wanting something sort of bright and yellow, and I don't know why. I love that sort of jonquil yellow that that is. And so then I just started playing off the colors in that. So I think that these will make a nice combination for a Vertices Unite. And I think I'm going to make the large one. I realize that that is a massive undertaking. But um, I'm a big girl. I need a big shawl, I guess. Keep me warm. Okay. All right. So that is sort of future crafting. That's probably going to get kicked down the road till the fall, but I do have the stuff. I have, I had these on hold at the yarn shop and picked them up uh, at the beginning of, of summer. So that's kind of in the end of my future crafting. So now we'll move officially on into um, acquisitions and if you don't want to see, my, my acquisitions other than this one are not yarny. I have some other acquisitions. Uh, and I wanted to talk about something that I want to try to do um, in the future. So uh, if you're not interested in that stuff and you're not interested in science and farming, thanks for coming and hanging out. And I hope to see you again. And if you are interested, let's move on down the road to acquisitions. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and this is not really an acquisition other than I've got something on my radar, um, the Autumn Acorn Knits podcast, uh, I believe her name is Judy, she has been doing yarn dyeing, and she started experimenting with some natural dyeing. And so that got me interested because, you know, owning a farm, I have access to things that I could use for natural dyeing. Um, and also, uh, 
Sasha is trying to think of ideas for the next Owls uh, series, and we had talked about maybe uh, doing some eco printing like I've seen on Ninja Chickens or doing uh, some natural dyeing. Now, they're not ready yet, but pretty soon we're going to have some berries. We're going to, well, we have blackberries already, but I kind of want to use those for um, food. <laughs> but we have pokeberries, which you can't eat. And you also have um, elderberries, which you do eat, but I make a lot of them. So, I mean, I can only use so many. And then we have beauty berry. We have the uh, Southern Beer, I think it's American Beauty Berry, but all of those um, have a, a natural color to them. Now, the one downside that I was reading about all of those is they tend to be fugitive dyes. They tend to fade over time. But I found an article, or a, um, yeah, it was an article, and I pinned it on Pinterest about some people who had maybe a method that would keep those dyes from being quite so fugitive in the yarn. So I'm not ready to do this yet. I've got other things on my plate right now, but maybe later this fall or later this summer when these berries are all ripening, um, I want to try doing some natural dyeing. But she she has some um, tips and things, so I'll link her um, this latest video that she put out on there. But so my acquisitions for this um, week are the following. First of all, I wanted to share these because I think these are really nifty and cool. I got these at the same conference where I got um, the Sergeant Stubby bag. The Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission put together a set of the state symbol cookie cutters. And it's got a little tag on here that tells you what the different symbols are. So for example, our state bird is the mockingbird. Our state instrument is the fiddle, okay? It's not a violin here, it's a fiddle, okay? We have Ozark Folk Center. Um, our state tree is the pine tree. Well, I mean, this looks more like a, a Christmas tree, but I guess you could say it was a pine tree. All right, then of course, we've got some, we got the white-tailed deer is our state mammal, okay? And then, let's see what else have we got. We've got, um, Oh, yeah, we've got, of course, here's the state cookie cutter. All right. And we have a few other things. Here's the bumblebee, or the honeybee, rather. Okay. So, um, I got a set of those from the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission. And I actually have an Arkansas-themed Christmas tree that I do. It's a small one. But um, I'm going to, oops, <laughs> I'm going to save those up for use on that. Okay. Um, the next thing that I got is I'm going to show some fabric that I bought back at the beginning of summer um, with the idea of something being bright and spring-like and lovely. Okay, so um, I bought, these are sort of the focus fabrics that I bought. I got this one with the feathers on it. And then I got this one with the mermaids and the octopi and uh, just sea life on it. I thought that was really sweet. This is a twill, okay. Then I got um, the llamas or alpacas or whatever this is. And last but not least, I got these really cute owls. All right, and then I got coordinating fabrics to kind of go with them. They've been sitting over there by a bag of cedar shavings, so they smell really good. But anyway, so I got these coordinating fabrics. So one of these days, I'm going to rare up and make some project bags. Maybe this week. I've been thinking about it. I kind of have to get it on my mind, and then I'll finally do it. Um, so those are some fabrics. Now, uh, I had mentioned the book, The Year at Maple Hill Farm, and I said that I had ordered the companion book. This is the companion book, Our Animal Friends at Maple Hill Farm. I had mentioned uh, Alice and Martin Provinson, and she talks about all the different animals at her farm, okay, and uh, it says on the back, who lives at Maple Hill Farm? Two dogs, five horses, a pig, some geese, lots of chickens, a few cows, a few goats, several sheep, and four special cats. Now, um, so what she does is she goes through and talks about the sort of the behavior and the temperament of the different <laughs> the different animals at the farm. It's really sweet. Um, you know, and, and here's a picture that's very familiar to, to anyone who's got cattle. <coughs> Sometimes they get out. <laughs> I've made that face many times. 
<laughs> chasing cows there. Okay. Um, and then, you know, and she is pretty honest. I mean, she's got a section here where she talks about dogs that aren't with them anymore for various reasons. Like one of them chased cars and one of them bit people and, and things like that. Um, so, you know, it's a pretty honest um, book, which I like that. And then it talks about some of the wildlife that lives, that's part of the farm. And then at the end, she has a section, um, let's see if I can find it, um, for the animals that were, so a little tribute to the animals that are no longer, no longer with them, the animals that are, and the animals that will be. So, I like that. I like that. So, um, I, I was completely unaware of her as a, as a children's author until um, recently. And so, I'm, I, I really love her books. I really love that um, her style of writing makes me very happy. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Of course, here you got the one about the horses. You know, you got that on there. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, I got that. The last book that I'm going to mention, I'm going to talk more about it at the end, but this is a book written by a friend of mine, Byron Ballard. It's called Earthworks Ceremonies for the Tower Time, or in Tower Time. And this is a book, um, sort of an alternative um, religion book about honoring the earth. And she had asked me to read it and write a review of it, so I'm actually listed as one of the reviewers in here. Um, but she is an Appalachian um granny woman and I love to listen to her speak and so um, she and I hit it off like peas and carrots uh, when we met and because we're both good old mountain women <laughs> and so she has a lot of um, good stories in here and then also um, some things you can do to sort of honor the earth and, and treasure this planet that we live on so uh, we'll talk more about that at the end so that's all of my acquisitions for this week. So now let's come back and talk a little bit about farm life. Well, I said it backwards. We're going to talk about science first. <laughs> anyway, if y'all been watching me a while, you know that that's the order of the things that go in. Um, first of all, I wanted to mention a really cool, cool article that came out in... Uh, Physical Review X, or Physical Review 10, I guess, but uh, it was on the APS website, and then it got picked up by several knitting people on Instagram, and actually, Stephanie, who owns Knit Two Together, sent it to me. Uh, it's a really cool uh, study of why is knitted fabric so stretchy, and how does it have the stretchy properties that it has. Now, let me hasten to add you know, scientists a lot of time get made fun of for being, you know, for asking for funding for weird subjects like why does knitted fabric, why is knitted fabric stretchy? Why should we pay for a study for that? Well, here's why. Because it will help us produce maybe stronger nanomaterials or stronger construction materials if we understand the way knitted fabric works. And what they finally concluded was that it's not the fiber that's stretching. It is the way the fiber moves over itself, okay? Because a knitted fabric, instead of like with woven fabric, it's lots of pieces of individual pieces of fabric or individual uh, fibers that are locked together. With knitted fabric, it's basically one fiber locking onto itself, if you think about it, or if you hold it double, I guess it's more than one, but you get the idea. So they examined the stockinette stitch, and they said, okay, the fiber never actually really stretches um, when it was put under strain. And what happens to cause the knitted fabric to have stretch is how it slides or bends. Now, obviously, we know as knitters that some fibers do stretch, but stockinette fabric, even acrylic stockinette fabric, has more give to it than what the fiber does. And so the reason that they figured out for that is how the stitches slide and bend. The fiber itself doesn't have to stretch but the knitted fabric still has stretch, and they're talking about using this to build uh, nanomaterials. So I thought that was a really cool crossover between science and crafting there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about, and this has come up on a few 
um, come at me from a few directions. The first thing was, I don't know if any of you guys paid attention, but the National Geographic cover this month, which is called Planet or Plastic, uh, that has what looks like an iceberg, and then you look underneath it and you realize it's a, tra it's a, it's a grocery bag. It's a plastic bag. And um, that article, if you read it, is very eye-opening. It talks about the lack of recycling and how um, something like 18 billion tons of plastic are put into the ocean. And I'm trying to remember the timeline. I want to say every year. Um, you know, it goes back to the whole idea of there is no away. When you throw something away, there is no away. I mean, it goes somewhere. Um, you know, and people don't realize that this planet, everything on this planet is really connected and it's connected through the waterways. All right. So if you throw something in a stream or a creek or whatever, eventually, eventually, it's going to make its way to the oceans. And they were talking about how much of these tiny little bits and pieces of plastic are in the ocean and it's killing animals. You know, animals have been, you know, whales have washed up on the shore with pounds and pounds and pounds of plastic in their stomach. And of course, you see the pictures of the turtles, the sea turtles caught in the nets and the plastic and everything. And, and one of the most heart-rending pictures to me is that little seahorse that's hanging on to that Q-tip, thinking that he's hanging on to a piece of grass. Um, so I highly encourage you to read that article and then to be proactive. You know, I talked last week about um, think globally and act locally. You know, it is not easy to recycle where I live. It's just not. It's not easy to recycle at all um, because there is no, I mean, I live out in the country, so, you know, I don't have a municipal recycling thing. Um, the town that I lived in had recycling bins behind the library, which you could access anytime day or night or the weekend or whatever then they move them by the dog pound which our dog pound consists of some pins with a tin roof over it i can't go there y'all i can't i can't do it i can't go over there so i had to find a different way to deal with my recycling so i take it to work and recycle it or um since i'm not working at the university i'm teaching online right now um what i'm trying to do is take it um to where I teach writing lessons. There is a recycling, little recycling center there. Um, I've been hauling it around for a week. I got rid of part of it and I got rid of the rest of it, but it, it takes effort. But at the end of the day, I know that what I'm doing, I hope is helping. Um, because plastic takes forever to break down, 400 years or more, okay? Um, so, the other thing that was interesting today, I just noticed Dr. Kelly from U University put up a podcast about recycled materials being made into fiber. And she was talking about like clothing, the ridiculous amount of clothing that gets thrown away that ends up in the landfills. And it's, it, you know, sometimes we ought to be embarrassed. I mean, we really, <laughs> you know, I think about people that I know that buy items of clothing and maybe wear them one time before they throw them out. Or whatever now I realize a lot of people do donate I donate a lot of clothes um, but you know we don't fix stuff if something gets a hole in it we throw it away instead of fixing it or we just buy new clothes because they're cheap okay and you know we could go into a whole discussion of well that cloth you know where was that piece of clothing made and what were the conditions of the workers in that place and all that uh, which we're not going to do that because that's just too big of a topic for my mind to comprehend. But, but what she was saying is less than 10% of clothing that's purchased gets reused in some way. Now, I think as crafters, we tend to be more mindful of that kind of stuff. But we, I think we could all do, do a better job. Um, and she does a really nice job of talking about how uh, recycled plastics are made into fiber um, and how recycled clothing is made into fiber. And she gives examples. One of the examples that made me think about when I was talking about the denim was uh, Wool and the Gang have a yarn now. I think it's called Billie Jean's yarn. And it's all recycled denim. Because even when they um, make 
jeans. You know, there's pieces of fabric left over that would normally just go in the landfill. And, and then also, um, you know, there's yarns that are made out of recycled silk sar saris. So, you know, we can all do a little bit more. I mean, we can all do a little bit more to help this planet. <laughs> so um, I encourage you to listen to that or to watch her podcast. I'm going to link it below and also to check out that National Geographic article and also the article about knitting. I will, um, that article on APS is really, really easy to read. It's not a highly technical article and it has some, some neat videos in it. So I'll link both of those in the information down bar. Okay, so let's go on now and talk about farm life. <laughs> Okay, I realized last week I forgot to read you the piece about girls and horses. And so I want to read that to you now. Um, I like it because um, I'm not a big fan of participation trophies <laughs> because life doesn't give you participation trophies. Um, you know, I have a friend who races wagon races and he's, you know, people get mad when he wins. He said, you know, they sell faster horses every day. And, you know, people work it to being successful. And, 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 you know, if you want to be successful with anything, you have to work at it. So, I'm going to read you this little piece. I'm kind of have to glance over here. It says, Parents, let your daughters grow up to be horse girls. Because they will learn quickly and repeatedly that life isn't fair. That hard work is often trumped by lady luck. And that every defeat, no matter how terrible, is temporary. Let them dream big and kick on, which is a jumping phrase. Let them learn confidence, grace, and grit. Let them build big muscles and strong backs. Let your daughters grow up in the barn. Let them learn that buckets are, need filling and stalls need cleaning, even when it's raining and even when it's frozen, even when they have a different idea for how the day should go. Teach them to drive trucks and trailers, yes, <laughs> and ATVs. Teach them to change tires and wrap legs and give shots. And then let them leave a spur mark or a bit rub or a bandage bow and let them deal with the shame of causing pain to an animal that they love. Let them grow up with horses and with good horse people because it will teach them to be humble and to be resilient and to be brave. And I love that. <laughs> okay, I love that because I think it's, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm a strong advocate for the riding program that I participate in because we are training or I shouldn't say training we are shepherding or mentoring these young people not just girls there's some boys over there too on how to be better citizens of the world okay how to be humble and be resilient and be brave all three of those things I think are great character qualities to um instill in young people or even older people <laughs> so anyway i realized i had forgotten to read that and i wanted to share that with you because it really made an impact i had shared that on my farm page and so that leads me into um i took trixie to the barn um last week i wanted to take her to play day because we were going to celebrate her birthday and sing to her and stuff but i just got to thinking it would just be too much um it's kind of funny some of the horses over there when they see her think the aliens have landed and one of the horses that has the biggest reaction is her older brother uh sterling but we finally let them sort of touch noses and meet and then he was much calmer but um i just knew that i would have my hands full doing the announcing and so i decided i would not take her there but she did great we took her over um and actually we round pinned her in the big round pin for the first time then I had Eleanor put her in the stall and groom her and mess with her. I put a saddle on her and cinched it up. Now, the other day when I put a saddle on her the first time, I didn't put a cinch on it. I didn't put a girth on it, but I cinched it up. I put my dressage saddle on it and cinched it up. Walked her around with it. Climbed up the mounting block. You know, did all the stuff that we do in preparation for riding, and she just took it like a champ. So, I'm very optimistic about um, getting her going. I hope in the spring... To send her if this trainer that i'm sending bow to works out i'll probably send her off in the springtime uh just for 30 days just to kind of get her going and then let her have a break and then bring her back um you know later in her three-year-old year and um really start going with her then so yeah so uh we had some rain and oh my goodness i was so happy we had um 
luckily we did not get strong storms here but i shared on instagram some some cloud forms going by um we we had two days of rain we had some rain on friday evening early saturday morning before the play day and then we had quite a bit of rain off and on yesterday and it was much appreciated i mean yes there was some luckily we did not get strong winds here there was just a little burst of wind probably from the gust front and then it just rained and i was so so thankful because we have been incredibly dry here of course what that does then is let everybody start shooting off fireworks and we have firework stands up already and i'm not trying to be a grumpy old woman okay i'm not trying to be a grumpy old woman about the fireworks i want everybody to enjoy themselves on independence day but when you shoot them off at 1 a.m i have a problem with that okay it scares my animals first of all and second of all it's one freaking a.m some of us have to get up and go to work the next day okay um you know be considerate i mean i don't care if you shooting them off i mean you know whatever but at 1 a.m really <laughs> please don't do that so my plans for july 4th will be to stay home and keep my animals calm um so that is coming up you know in about well next week so oh here we go <laughs> with the hallelujah chorus i guess they knew i was talking about them hang on just a second okay now that the hallelujah chorus is over i'll get back to what we were talking about uh so we had a good rain and i'm very grateful for that uh saturday was our first of our series of play days at the barn where the kids do what we call speed events so barrel racing pole bending flag race where they have to pick a flag up out of one bucket and dump you know stick it in another bucket um which is a lot harder than it sounds <laughs> um um, jump lap obstacle course stuff like that so um, I'm always the announcer and then we have um, a couple of the parents or a couple of the other people at the barn be our timers um, so I'm always the announcer and last year I started bringing Bo in with me and making him stand there while I announced because it was good desensitization for him to have to stand there while the horses are warming up first of all and then also while horses are running past him and he is such a good boy he just stands there and watches he doesn't do anything now he does like to play with the pens i have to be really careful that he doesn't take my ink pen off of my uh, clipboard and try to eat it so i have to watch out for that <laughs> um but yeah so that's kind of what's going on the vet is due to come on thursday to do shots and to do uh, coggins testing and all of that uh, my little miniature horse seems to be getting around a lot better so hopefully we're kind of weathered that storm uh, for her the chicks are doing well they're starting to get bigger i'm gonna have to uh, move them around some the rabbits are all doing well in the heat because they have their fans um, the big chickens are doing well i have a broody hen which kind of surprised me because the the big chickens that i have are what are called red sex links which means you can tell whether they're roosters or, or um, hens when they're when they're hatched they've got a certain pattern on them that you can tell um, and normally, or they're sometimes called cinnamon queens or something like that. They're very good layers, but they are normally not broody. They normally do not want to sit on eggs. Well, one of these hens apparently did not get that memo because I've got a mama hen in there. She will flat put you on the move if you go in there and try to mess with her nest eggs. Um, so, yeah, so I've got a broody hen. I'll have to keep an eye on that because if she hatches any chicks out, I'll have to make sure I move her and the chicks into a smaller pen to keep them safe. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Now, I have been um, working on a few things. Um, I made blackberry jelly. My berries are all um, ripening. And so I've got some tame or thornless blackberry uh, bushes. So I made seven half pints of, actually, this is blackberry jam. I don't strain. I strain out as much of the seeds as I can, but I don't strain out the pulp. So this is actually blackberry jam that I made with my own blackberries. And then I also made a batch of pumpkin spice soap. So it's a rustic looking bar on the back. I just put it in a, in a flat soap mold. This is pumpkin spice. Oh, and it smells delicious. Soap. Um, and I actually used pumpkin puree that I had in the freezer from last year. And I used pumpkin pie spice. And then it's also got cinnamon oil and clove oil in it okay so this again is a true lye soap so it does need to cure but i think the pumpkin pie spice when you swirl it in gives it a neat 
texture. Of course, it's got some rough spots on it that I need to clean off, but you can see the spice kind of swirled through it there. So I'm learning. I'm learning about making soap, you know, trying to get better and better. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, that's kind of where we're at on the farm this week. Kind of short and sweet compared to some of my more rambling, <laughs> rambling moments. So let's come back um, with a few final thoughts. Okay, um, I wanted to end with a couple of final thoughts. I mentioned at the beginning or in the science section about the National Geographic um, article piece that's come out, their cover story about planet, plastic, planet or plastic. Um, and this sort of struck a deep chord in me. My particular spiritual way of thinking is we need to cherish this planet that we live on. Um, I feel like sometimes people treat this planet as sort of a truck stop on the way to their final reward, and I don't see it that way. Um, I see this planet that we live on as this beautiful gift that has given us. She nurtures us like our mother. Um, she takes care of us. Um, my dad was a big John Wayne movie fan, and there is a movie called The Cowboys, and... Um, I don't like it too much at the end because John Wayne dies <laughs> and hopefully they'll be quiet Shh. and um, they say a little prayer over him and they talk about the prairie is his mother and she holds him while he sleeps she nurtured him while he was alive and holds him while he sleeps and I kind of look at the earth in that way and like I mentioned, the picture of the little seahorse with the Q-tip hurts my heart. And I remember watching, and I don't remember what program it was, but it was a program about polar bears. And I, they were talking about the retreating ice caps. And this polar bear um, is looking for something to eat. It's hungry, it's clearly underweight. And he's swimming in the ocean and they pull back from the shot and from horizon to horizon, there's no ice. And that image haunts me. Okay, that haunts me because we have to do better <laughs> about taking care of this planet. And so, um, I wanted to read a little piece out of Byron's book. Um, it's She's got a meditation in here about kind of centering yourself and how to meditate on your relationship with the earth. I actually wanted to read two pieces. Um, the first one is sort of the benediction from this meditation section. And it's, may you have dew for a blessing and abundant rain for water is the need of all green and growing things. Every plant and tree make deep our roots and wide our crowns that we may blossom in season and bring forth our fruits of goodness and of beauty. We ask the ancient ones to strengthen our hands and our backs and give us hearts to revive the sacred soil, our oldest mother. I like that. Okay, and that's, you know, part of what drew me back here was this land called me back. Um, you know, you can talk about Scarlett O'Hara syndrome, you know, the, the soil, the red soil of Terra or whatever, but um, this land called me back just as surely as anything else uh, brought me back here. And so to honor and respect this land is really important to me. The last thing I want to read is a reading that she wrote after um, the really terrible wildfires that um, Appalachia, if you remember Gatlinburg, for those of you who are familiar, Gatlinburg, Tennessee was devastated by some horrible wildfires that someone actually set. And I remember watching, um, you know, I follow a Celtic inspired uh, band called Tuatha Day, and I'm going to link a video that they did called Appalachia Burning that is a beautiful song. It just gives me chills thinking about it. Um, I remember watching that vi the videos of the fires and, and 
you know, that part of the country is very close to me because those are some old, old hills and old, old mountains. And it's not that far from me. And there was a man who was looking for his wife and two daughters. And unfortunately, they had died in the fire. And I just remember this pain and this intense just grief that this man had on his face watching, you know, you know, of course the news had a camera stuck in his face. But, you know, as, as Byron pointed out and as the song points out, you know, fires, the fire comes and goes and then new growth and new life comes from that. And so she wrote a, a little um, prayer or, or a poem it's called Let Appalachia Rise. Let Appalachia Rise. I believe in the justice of the ancestors. I believe in the wisdom of the hills and hollers. I believe in the strength of the people. Let Appalachia Rise. I swear by my granny's apron. I swear by the cool, sweet water. I swear by the blood of my people. Let Appalachia Rise. And I think if we all took a little more time to become grounded where we're at, it may not be the land of your people, but, you know, it's the old bloom where you're planted thing. I think it's important to honor this planet. And so I hope and I strive to do that every single day, every single way here on this farm. And I guess part of the reason why I started doing this podcast was to share those thoughts with you. So, um, anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, if you liked it, please give us a thumbs up and feel free to leave me a comment. Um... And then we'll see you next time. So until we see you again, be good to each other. Take care of each other and peace out. Bye.